Hello and welcome to another instalment of London's Fashion Alphabet. My name's Natasha and I'm an assistant curator at the Museum of London. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're unable to film in our dress and textile store today. So this and possibly the next few episodes will be coming to you from our homes. Our collections are waiting safely for our return. And in the meantime, I found some lovely images to show you. Today, we're looking at the letter W, which stands for winter warmers. And I want to show you some objects that Londoners have used in the past to keep warm during the bitter winter months, particularly when they're traveling around and about the city. And indeed, all the objects that I've chosen today are from the later Victorian period, because it was quite a dynamic time. People traveled by carriages. However, the railways were also in full swing and then later on, the first motor vehicles started to appear on London streets. Now, traveling in half open carriages and cars was a chilly business, so you needed a really warm outer garment. And this mantle is a cloak, sleeveless cloak, which functions much like an overcoat. And this one has an outer cape with an inner buttoned robe. And it's made from wool and twill, which is a really durable fabric, perfect for the outdoors and traveling. It still has its price tag and it has its style name, the Bremen. And in the later 19th century, we saw the mass production of ready to wear tailored garments made possible by the rise of the steam powered mills to produce textiles and factories making use of the sewing machine to more rapidly create the garments. It also links into the rise of the department store at the end of the 19th century, which provided consumers with a greater choice in their winter attire. Fur was also a popular fashion choice in the later Victorian period, and to keep hands warm, women would often use fur muffs. I wanted to show you these two muffs from our collection that belonged to Princess Louise, who was the sixth child and fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. They're made from musquash fur, we know that fur isn't an ethical choice today, but in Victorian times, it was very popular. And the poor musquash, because of its quick reproduction cycle, was a popular choice because it was relatively cheap. Now, normally the fur is a darker golden brown color, but these two muffs have been dyed to get the dark brown and the white. There's some speculation that Louise bought these furs from Regent Street furrier, W.C. Williams, just ahead of her move to Canada in 1878, where her husband became Governor General. Now that our hands are toasty warm, we're going to my other pet hate, cold feet. And often women would have to wear to formal events these indoor shoes, so you've got your silk evening pumps, which would not provide a lot of warmth. So in going to and from these events, they would wear a pair of carriage boots. This pair of carriage boots is one of my favorites from the collection. There's um, in really good condition. They're black velvet lined with fur and also with the silk black ribbons. But you can see from the boots that they don't have a heel. They're not meant for a lot of walking. They're really just a beautiful glorified slipper. And inside we have, do have a picture where you can just see a glimpse of red flannel so flannel was really popular for petticoats and shirts. It's a really nice, soft, durable fabric that provides extra warmth in the winter. I've delved into our social history collections to show you this pair of ceramic boot warming and drying lasts from the 1860s, mainly because I think they're exquisite. And it just illustrates how the Victorians could further warm their, their feet. They would fill the, the last, the ceramic last with water. You can see there's a hole in the top and it would just warm the shoe much like a hot water bottle before they pop their shoes on. Or if they came back from a walk and their shoes were a bit damp, they could also be used to dry the shoes out. This pair here, I've seen that it comes with a little ceramic heel that when it's not in use, you can just stand it on. But unfortunately we don't have that with ours. They bear the royal crest of Queen Victoria, who was known to suffer from cold feet. The final item I'd like to show you today is more of a utilitarian object, somewhat less glamorous. It's the humble blanket. And to illustrate this, I want to show you a painting from our collection called The Late Frost, painted by William Small in 1881. And it shows Edward, Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's eldest son, 
outslaying on the Thames Embankment. Um, now what happened in 1881 in January, there were severe gales and snowstorms that brought the city to a standstill. And then a hard frost persisted into February. And here, what I wanted to draw your attention to was the huge blanket wrapped around Edward. We have several carriage rugs in our collection and I wanted to show you this one made of navy blue Melton cloth with a tartan backing in red and blue. Now Melton is a really dense thick woolen cloth in which the twill weave pattern is concealed by finishing processes which makes it particularly hard wearing, weather resistant, wind resistant and just really perfect to keep give you that extra layer of warmth when you're out and about. So this rug protected carriage passengers from a household near Regent's Park from about 1860 to 1910. We also have the matching rug that was used by the coach driver. Um, however, I don't have a photo of that one, sorry. Um, blankets were also essential for railway travel and often rail companies would provide people with a railway rug or people would bring their own to kind of wrap around them inside the drafty carriages. So that comes to the end of the objects I wanted to show you today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm aware that a lot of what I've shown you would have been only available to Londoners um, who are better off financially. Winter could be a real struggle for poorer Londoners and I think that will have to be the subject of another talk. But for now, I'm going to say farewell and ask you to tune in next time to find out what the letter X stands for in London's fashion alphabet. Thanks for joining me.